Okay, um, I'm going to be talking about um, assessing natural hazard risk um, from water on the Historic Environment Scotland estate. Um, this is uh, based on work carried out uh, by myself, David Harkin, who's climate change scientist at Historic Environment Scotland, um, and uh, a couple of external partners. Um, I thought it would be useful, given we've got quite a mixed audience, to briefly summarise um, the already observed uh, change in Scotland since the 1960s in term of, terms of climate change. Uh, broadly speaking, we've got uh, fewer days of frost, um, fewer days of snow cover, um, a significantly lo longer growing season, so about five weeks longer than it was. Um, we've already had a one degree Celsius rise in temperature. Um, we've ha we have, on average, more than 20% more rain um, than we had in the early 60s. And the sea level is rising by three to four millimetres a year, and it's speeding up. Um, our climate projections uh, indicate we're quite fortunate in the UK. We have really detailed climate projections. Uh, UKCP09, um, and we're eagerly anticipating uh, new climate projections which are due to come out uh, this year. But uh, by the 2050s, um, we're expecting that uh, summers will be uh, warmer and drier, um, and that uh, in the winter um, it will be warmer and wetter. Um, however, that's coupled with um, an increase in extreme weather events. Um, so we've looked at uh, 336 properties um, in the care of Historic Environment Scotland. So these are monuments in state care. Um, many are situated in some of the most susceptible areas to natural hazards. Um, they're often situated in defensive uh, sites or sites with easy access to natural resources. Um, so we've got lots of coastal sites, lots of sites situated near rivers and so on. And what we realised when we started looking at this subject was that really we didn't have a good understanding of current natural hazard risk across our estate. Um, although we were aware of risks at some sites, we hadn't looked at it in a systematic way. And we realised that um, if we could understand that, we would have a much better understanding of what our risk was in terms of future climate change, moving towards w warmer, wetter winters, hotter, drier summers. Um, so we've pulled together um, various data sets um, from the Scottish Environment Protection Agency, SEPA, and the British Geological Survey. And we've looked at natural hazard risk from coastal erosion, ground instability, and various kinds of flooding, fluvial, pluvial, coastal, and groundwater flooding. Um, so our assumption is that as climate change intensifies, we'll get increased occurrence of rates of natural hazard events. Um, and as you'll have realized, a lot of these are um, very much linked to water, which of course is the subject um, of our seminar today. Um, I thought it'd be useful to um, show this slide, which shows uh, the relationship between landslides um, and rainfall. Um, this is from the British Geological Survey. And broadly speaking, um, landslides increase following um, heavy rain. Um, and extreme weather events. So there is quite a clear relationship there, um, as there is um, with various types of uh, flooding. So we've taken a, a, a fairly standard approach um, to risk assessment, um, which has been informed by Adaptation Scotland's five steps to managing your climate risk, which is available online. Um, and we've begun with a spatial analysis in a GIS, um, overlaying the various data sets that we've acquired um, with our site boundary data. Um, I should stress that our site boundaries often extend far beyond what people traditionally think of as the site, whether that's a castle, um, a stately home, um, a prehistoric uh, stone circle. 
Um, and we've assigned a score of a likelihood score of one to five for each hazard, with five being the most likely um, and one being the least likely. Um, the site uh, in this slide is uh, Fort George, um, which is an 18th century uh, promontory fort um, at Ardaseer, which is near Inverness in the north of Scotland. Um, and I think what's uh, important to note in this slide is that um, in the <coughs> in the coastal erosion um, uh, slide, which is the middle of the bottom row, um, you can see two areas um, which are uh, coloured red um, as being um, uh, likely to suffer coastal erosion. Um, so this is a summary of the data sets we've used. Um, this was quite a long process to actually um, decide how we were going to fit likelihood to the various um, data sets. They're all different. Um, so we've also sc scored on impact um, with the score being dependent on the type of property and the type of hazard in question. Um, there's a few examples here of the kinds of properties that we're dealing with. Um, Macri Moor on the bottom right has been rather prone um, to flooding. Um, so we've scored the impact uh, based on um, dividing the estate into um, three uh, categories. Um, now these categories um, are also used by our conservation architects in managing the estate. But broadly speaking, you can split the estate into uh, roofed monuments, um, unroofed monuments, and uh, thirdly, field monuments and uh, standing and car stones. Um, we assumed, uh, for the purpose of this exercise, that um, the impact would be different on a, on a roofed monument to an unroofed monument and so on and that uh, field monuments would might often be more resilient than, say, a roofed monument which had a collection inside it um, of artefacts um, or paintings or so on. Um, we also looked at whether the site was staffed. Um, we thought that um, a site that was staffed um, would be uh, more likely um, uh, to have a um, faster reaction um, to um, an extreme weather event um, uh, that might precipitate flooding and so on. Um, and we also looked at whether the site's open all year round. Some of our sites are only open seasonally, um, so there's no staff presence on the ground for a significant part of the year. So we calculated risk using impact times likelihood. Um, one of the main reasons that we did that was um, to ensure that um, the results of this could be fed up into um, the risk registers um, for um, our directorate and for the organisation as a whole. Um, this was never an academic exercise. It was about ensuring that we were in the best position to manage the risks on the estate. So um, we found, based on those uh, variables that we've discussed, um, that uh, the majority of our sites um, had um, a, a, a significant <laughs> um, high or very high um, risk um, and that even once we took into account mitigating factors we were left with um, the majority of our sites um, being at risk of one or more of those variables at an unacceptable level. Um, so um, this is just a sample of um, the uh, sites that, that we've looked at showing the, showing the results, but you can see that uh, a lot of these sites have quite a significant uh, level of risk for one or more um, of the hazards in question. So I thought it'd be useful to have a quick look at uh, the uh, sites we've been looking at. Um, this is, uh, that's not Thrive Castle, <laughs> that's Blackness Castle. <laughs> um, Blackness Castle, which is on the Firth of Forth, um, and uh, is on a promontory sticking out into the Forth. 
Um, and that uh, showed um, a significant level of risk of coastal erosion. Um, now, when we looked at this site on the ground, we discovered that actually um, there was a renewal of defences on exactly that part of the site already um, taking place. Um, so I think um, while people haven't tended on the sites to think of um, these issues as being related to climate change, they are often very much aware of them um, and are actively managing them. This is Fort George. <laughs> so uh, Fort George, again, um, I flagged up to you when we looked at this site before that there are two areas flagged as being at high risk of coastal erosion. The one on at the top of the slide to the north um, is actually where um, there is a sluice gate complex um, which has already been quite badly damaged by wave action and several years ago before we actually undertook um, this exercise um, there was uh, rock armour put in place um, that was a joint exercise between ourselves and the army the army did it as a training exercise and um, they actually co-occupied this site um, and the area on at the bottom um, is uh, some 20th century um, duck platforms uh, from the war, which again we were aware of um, being quite severely affected um, by, by, by coastal erosion. Um, thirdly, um, I thought we could look at uh, Kilhern uh, Castle. Um, which uh, has been uh, shown to be at significant risk of fluvial flooding. Now, this is an interesting one. It's um, effectively on an island. And as you can see from uh, the map top left, um, it's at significant risk um, of uh, various um, uh, flood um, events, um, both, well, one in 10, a year flood event, one in a hundred year flood event, and the one in a thousand year flood event. Um, however, um, when we started looking at this site um, and the historical records, uh, we realised that um, this site used to be um, an island in a, in a loch, and it was subject to improvements in the 18th century, um, and a lot of the area round about is very marshy. Um, you can physically walk to the site now, um, but what's happening in these flood events is the site is almost trying to return to its previous state. Um, and the castle is actually in um, a context that it's very much designed for in that flood, in that flood event. Um, so it's, it's quite resilient. And I think that's the case for quite um, a lot of our sites is that they were designed to um, cope in these, um, in these environments. Um, so um, it's not all doom and gloom. Um, I think the main thing is that we're actually aware of, of these risks and can manage them where, where it's appropriate. But I think also it's really important that you kind of scratch below the surface and actually start looking at the environmental history of sites um, that, that uh, you're assessing to get a really detailed picture of what's going on in the landscape. So um, we've come up with a list of the sort of top 28 um, sites which are, seem to be most at risk, um, but they're not necessarily the ones you might expect uh, for various reasons. Um, as I say, it's a very limited number of natural hazards that we've actually looked at in this. There are more, but we don't have the, the high quality data sets that we would like for those. Um, so. Um, all this is actually, I was published in January, um, so you can download um, our report uh, from the Historic Environment Scotland website. Um, I'll post the link on Twitter again um, so that people can find it easily. Um, we're also looking at publishing a methodology because um, what, we've, what we've always wanted is that, um, that, this is, that the methodology we've developed is, is reused um, by others. Um, and that's actually already happening. So I think that kind of document would be really useful for people. Um, as I say, we're looking at uh, conducting more in-depth uh, site-specific studies like we've done at Kilhern at other sites. Um, 
And we're also having uh, conversations with the staff involved, both in the visitor operations at these sites um, and in the um, conservation and maintenance of the sites. Um, the results of this have already been fed into um, the asset management plan for the estate um, and the investment plan. Um, and the, the results are also part of the new asset management system um, for the estate that's being developed at the moment. Um, so in future, we're also going to be looking at other variables working closely in partnership with our science team colleagues um, at the engine shed in Stirling. Um, and we're looking forward to um, the new climate uh, projections um, UK CPA team um, and what they actually mean for our work. Um, thank you very much.